Welcome to b &H Videos. Our products have been all over the world, from the top of the Himalayas on expeditions to undersea. Um, they're built with a quality factor for holding up. I mean, that's the whole point about it. I'm an end user. I, I came out of that world of using product and being able to say, I don't like the Sisti, I like Strand. I don't like Mo Richardson, I like Airy, whatever. Um, I know that the form factor is really important in the design aspect of what you're putting out and my partners do as well from their background. So we've, we've got all your minds encased in ours and saying, what would I do if I was going to use it? And that's why I say the difference between a lot of the manufacturers you'll find on the floor that have come out with similar products to ours, they're manufacturers. They had to wait until we did something and then copy it. They don't think in that analogy of how the end user is going to use it or what makes it more valuable to the end user. What's the difference? That SD Wi-Fi card is great, but it may not be useful for you if you're hand carrying it around until that one time that you can use it and it saves your, your shot. Um, there's a lot of disadvantages as well as advantages. Um, but I think most of that has to do with things such as adequate heat sinking. That die will die no pun intended, unless you get the heat off it. There's just, you, you, you'll go downstairs and look at other products a little different after this. You'll look at products similar to this. This has got air, air holes all around it. We don't use metal as a heat sink. Okay? This mini, now called the mini plus, that housing design is a special extrusion with pins. And the reason we don't use fins, which is real cheap and easy, is because if I've got fins running this way, I have to have the light like this most of the time to get that heat to flow off those fins. The minute I turn it like this, now it's having a hard time. But with pins, you have heat dissipation at any angle. Every side of that surface is catching the updraft no matter where you hold it. The same with uh, uh, the micro, the micro pro. Having ventilation for the circuit board is important because we've put in just the amount we know we can regulate and hold the value of the LED the longest. We could have put twice as many LEDs in here. It's going to die. It's going to change color. You're going to be upset. So there's a there's a there's a true fact here, which is if you're if you're using LEDs, the product has to breathe. You have to get the heat off the die. It's, it's the most important part. Where you'll run into a problem is if you're doing a video and you've put these under the floor and boxed it and put plexiglass on it and tied it into a, a laptop or to a dimmer board and you're making a chase. It's not because of the chasing. It's not because they're upside down. The fact is you've sealed it now, and there is heat. And if it sits in there for hours and hours and hours and hours, you could have a problem. It needs to breathe. You know, it needs to breathe. Um, this was one of my, I worked on this so hard, this presentation flag, guys. I'm sorry that it's not there. <laughs> I got here to New York. I put it in this morning. I went, well, that'll be fun to explain. Um, but what I did and what is available in the catalog that you're all uh, welcome to have at the end of the show is uh, where we did a graph by an independent. It's called the white sheet. And it talks about how the light is in regards to BTUs it's putting out, British thermal units, measurement of heat. Also in power consumption. And the other one is, I um, um, can't remember. I'll be reminded later. So we have this one, we have this one, and we have this one. This I dug up because um, I thought it was very interesting as per the EPA, you know, if you, if, if you break a fluorescent tube, EPA says leave the building immediately. The reason is because of mercury. Now fluorescents are, are, are going through this really huge change. 
you're seeing a lot of advertising for uh, them from your energy companies. They do work. They do reduce. They do reduce, but they have nowhere near the power savings that an LED does. Unfortunately, right now LEDs are so expensive. You've seen the replacement bulbs. You may have even bought some. Uh, the factor is, they're still expensive compared to a fluorescent. But the mercury is an important part if you truly believe in whatever you give to the world, you need to be responsible for. The five of us do, as does the company that owns us. Um, we have a choice in making a product that we think can be uh, more environmentally sound. If you look at experts' estimates on 500 million lamps from fluorescence being thrown in the landfill a year, uh, into a landfill. There's recycling facilities that can do it very easily and safely, but a lot of people unfortunately don't, whether it's batteries or this or that. Uh, the part about 30 pounds of mercury being released, I don't think this is uh, an exaggeration. I think it's a very conservative estimate. And the fact that uh, one ton of mercury vapor in the atmosphere, and the fact that a gram of mercury into a 20 acre lake polluting it, um, those, are, those are real things. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna put a product out, I have to think at what cost do I want to make a profit and put something to the world? And the next one goes to what's called Rojas. Is anyone familiar with Rojas? Okay, Rojas is a standard that was set up by uh, the UK. And basically what it is is no mercury. And every product, every part of that product is recyclable. Every electronic component, circuit board no lead solder. So we had to do this for the UK in order to sell our products there legally. We said, why don't we do it for all of our products? Why do we just have to hold it for the UK? So at a cost to us for those special components, we decided that that's what we're doing. Uh, it makes good business sense. Uh, everything's the same. You don't have to worry, am I sending the UK unit or the EU unit or the USA unit? But also it works in factor of a lot of people who are thinking about this like we are. So the fact that it's an um, environmentally friendly product is, uh, is a good thing. My kids are proud of me. Um, the other thing is we never know where it's going to go. Our products are used all over the world in all different environments. Now underwater, Pete Romano Hydroflex has designed uh, lighting housings to put these in and use. They're in use for a lot of different things. Our products go places we don't even know about until somebody tells us. Um, we're also um, in the International Space Station. Uh, NASA ordered 60 of these, of which I believe at this point 40 are in use in the International Space Station. Uh, there's a reason NASA picked our product. Uh, they have been out for a long time. They've, they've been in every environment from, you can imagine, and they hold up, but also they're solid. You can't just run down there and send one back to have a, a LED replaced in it. Uh, they use the sun for power. They use Panasonic backpack, uh, Panasonic batteries, so like your video batteries. Uh, we make an adapter plate that you can snap on the back of that light panel. It takes the place of our battery, so you can use your own DV batteries for it. So all in all, I think that uh, the products have been accepted and used in most every environment you can think of for many, many years. So we're very proud of what we've done. We're also using that as the cursor to move forward into the next level of, of LED lighting available for end users. That's what we'll do at NAB. We'll introduce new products that will work in conjunction with what people have bought um, and a number of different things. Is uh, David still here? Is it getting hot in here? Or? Nope, everybody's cool? Great. Gallium nitride is the phosphor mixture, um, like an ammonia mixture, not ammonia, but a, um, the phosphors that are in there are, are not of the level where they can't be, um, can't be um, exposed. If you take a fluorescent tube out, the way the fluorescent tube works is the phosphors are coated on the inside of the tube. And the voltage and current runs through a mercury gas inside that tube. If that tube shatters, that dust is emitted. These are baked. So if they were to 
bust open, they would all stay contained within the epoxy cap or contained within the reflector because they're baked into place. There's no gas. There's no gas. That's why NASA's used them on a number of different projects. Um, there's no flashpoint from AC, direct current, a lot of different factors in it. And we've done a number of specialty projects I can't talk about that is because of the technology incorporated in a different housing and usage. But that's a tremendous amount of light that that blue dye is putting out. That actually, my light, this light here would be three times as bright if we were just looking for blue light. But because we're putting coatings of different phosphor mixes to create either tungsten or daylight is the reason why you're getting less out of it. Now, if, um, if we looked at one of our newer products, which is called our, let's do this real quick. What are we doing on time? Are we into it for an hour? Wow. It's doing good. This is our one by one on battery. Sorry. Has everybody seen the one by one or used it or read about it or no, not at all. Okay. So what we're doing is I showed you a unit earlier where it's a daylight balance and we can put a gel in, we can put a soft diffuser in. If I was going to go out and buy this, I could buy it in a flood configuration, 50 degree angle of dispersion. Am I okay here? Or do I need to get in the light? Yeah. Matt's watching me because those cameras are going to eventually change out to uh, higher quality so you can work with less light. Um, so you have 50 degree angle dispersion, you have 30 degree angle dispersion, and then you have 15 degree angle dispersion. So I can either buy a flood, a spot, or a super spot. Where am I going to be next week? Where am I going to be filming? Do I need a spot because I need a little bit more of the light collimated into a tighter area? Or am I going to be in a dark place where I need it as wide as possible so it doesn't look like a spotlight? So look, if, you're going to, if you've got a question, buy one of each. Well, in actuality, if you're lighting somebody, lighting's fairly simple. It's three points of light. Or if you've got existing light, maybe just a key light. Or maybe it's just a fill light. So why didn't we, well, we will. We built a unit that would have both a spot and a flood, just like we've done here with this bicolor. This bicolor is tungsten. I'll take the intensity down a bit. What we've done is we've actually put tungsten LEDs, and right next to it, we put daylight LEDs. So instead of needing the gels to change, you're actually going to, change them with this potentiometer in the back. Now that, that's a big part when we start talking about current and current control and voltage and overheating. If we turned all these LEDs at once, it would last, but not that long, simply because we're overdriving the LEDs. They're getting hot. The surface area that's on that circuit board, it's, it doesn't have enough area for it to breathe because they're both banging into each other. So now the thing starts to cook. One second, please. Now the thing starts to cook. So what we've, what we've done is we've given the ability to run it at the proper power. If I, if I go from daylight to tungsten, you can see that actually the tungsten is coming up as the daylight's going down. So we never cross that threshold. Um, and the value is that I can find a specific color of... Um, I can find a specific, a specific color that fits to the lighting in here. I would say that if I was lighting this down in the front, I want to give them a, just a little bit warmer tone. Now, I'll bring it up in intensity, but I, I could be full tungsten or I could be full daylight, but I think because I've got an eighth CTO, color, color temperature orange correction on that, I'd probably want to get it somewhere in this area. I'd want to use the color maybe more than the light output, to really pull them out of my shot. Because when you start mixing tungsten and daylight together in a shot, it really stretches dramatically between the two. Okay? I can also, 
which is kind of cool is this little DMX control thing I was talking about in the back, which is where I plug it in to a control board to control the color temperature or the output. I can actually do here, if I use these cues, which are normally marked as one through nine, each one of the three, I would say, okay, this unit is zero, zero, one. This is my first unit. So on my dimmer board, I'm gonna use slide zero, zero, one, but I'm also gonna use slide zero, zero, two, because I wanna set my color temperature, and then I wanna set my light output. So my next unit would be zero, zero, three, and I would use three and four. The next unit would be five, and I'd use five and six, and so on and so on. But one of the cool things we said would be neat to do is, you may not have a color temperature meter. You may be looking at a monitor to set your balances. So you could have four or five units, and it's like, you don't want to go around to each unit playing with the color, and you kind of want to find out what one is. Or you could say, I'm going to go and make this eight. See how the power light went to orange? Okay, it went to orange because now I, I can't control the light output with this dimmer anymore. It said, I'm turning you off, and you tell me what color temperature you want to be. So the first number is eight. That's how we get into that program. And now I say, okay, I'm at 54. That means I'm at 5,400 Kelvin. Does everybody understand Kelvin? Okay, so tungsten's 32, daylight's 54, that's 6,000. All right, I, wanna, I don't want to be at 54. I want to be closer to 44. Actually, I want to be at 34. So by changing that to 34, it's calibrated to know what color temperature each LED needs to put out. So I could actually have a monitor. I could go through these just in hundreds. I could go from 34 to, to, uh, my nails, to 44. Yes, on the back it says 44 in our factory in Van Nuys, California, because we make everything in the U.S. in Van Nuys, California. Um, we've set a calibration machine, which actually takes every unit and it runs the program and makes sure that every unit at 44 will be 4400 Kelvin. So you could have seven of these units, put them all at 844 guys or gals, okay? It's, it's a means of having the ability to control the light with a little bit more specific. Uh, uh, specific. You can do whatever you want, as quickly as you want. You could forego how long it takes you to look there and hit it and jump through it. But if you have several, and exactly, you say, I always like shooting at 44 or 4,800. Somebody over here had a question. Yes, sir. We will, we will, for the most part, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible for small units. If, <coughs> color's huge, but also there's interchangeable filters. You know, there's filters for these units that go on the back, you can pull it off. It's much nicer. And so we'll, we'll probably introduce something like that again, but the whole idea is working through one phase into the next, letting you know what can be done. Yes, so the, the bifocus, which is this unit, is the same thing, same unit. And that comes to the point of, do I need a flood or do I need a spot? So we can actually take the unit and we can go, uh, we can go from a flood setting, uh, spot setting to a flood setting. So would you hold this for me? And you light me, and you're gonna use the dimmer up there that says flood or spot. You can see that the light's at a wide angle, and as he spots in, it becomes a narrower beam. So we're electronically taking the flood spot focus realm out. We're shifting from one LED to the other. So anywhere from a 30 degree, 50 degree angle to a 30 degree angle is. No, once you find the intensity you want, it won't change it. These are all part of the, uh, well, the colors aren't changing because we're not doing Tungsten daylight, tungsten daylight, tungsten daylight. We're saying that you would love to have a daylight unit because it balances the daylight, it balances to cameras, it balances to monitors. We'll give you the opportunity to put a gel in, and then you can use your flood spot ability electronically. So that's that's a big change. 
because in a traditional light, the light has to be this deep because your Fresnel on the front is a fixed point. Your reflector and your bulb are a fixed point until you start to change. The closer you bring that light and reflector to the front, the more area it's seeing. So the wider the light's going. But you have to have a mechanical travel mechanism to get it from here to there. We've taken it another step. We've done it electronically by saying, we know you either want to be this wide or this wide or anywhere in between. And so that's the factor of putting too much heat on the unit of having bicolor and by focus, you're putting too many variables on that will run the heat up on the LEDs and it'll cause distraction and, and death to it. <clears throat> There's a number of photographers that are working with a combination of strobes and these lights. Because that they don't react at any shutter speed or anything, they're constant, it's basically you're setting a value, just like you would in a modeling light. So you know what you're getting out of your strobes and you're bringing that light in close enough or at the right output so that it's there. It's there no matter when you hit the trigger for the camera. Have, have, having the ability to use something large, like that 16 unit you saw on the streets in New York, is real practical because uh, you may decide that you're doing a shot, you want to blow the background out in a, in a hangar of somebody sitting by a car or something. You can put your strobes on the back wall, that'll blow it out to infinity, and then set your values on the people with these soft, no heat generating lights. There's a lot of different ways that people are, are introducing it into their own style. Um, it's it's uh, quite different. Um, we have a lot of accessories that we've done in regards to, uh, for instance, you know, our backpack battery. Well, some of you don't want to buy your backpack battery, Pat, because you have your own battery. So we made, for instance, adapter plates. You have gold pin or V-mount. You're able to snap this on the back of the unit and use your own camera battery. Um, the uh, the people that are using it out in the rain, um, we've made a, you know a rain hat for it, which is designed so that actually the heat is being pulled out. You don't want to enclose it. So, for instance, they were using this at NASCAR simply because it was raining or champagne being splashed, and it protects the unit. Um, the gels are laminated thermally. There's no glue or adhesive used. And the fact that there's no heat generated means even if your gels get scratched up, they're going to last forever unless you lose them or somebody forgets them. What we've done is, um, the, if you think about how the cameras are going, for instance, um, sorry, uh, onboard dimmers, AA batteries. Um, we introduced a new hybrid that will be available at the end of April um, that will actually have a flash option built into this. Um, the idea for all these is you don't need as much light as you may need in other situations. It's, it's taking advantage of the hot shoe but it's not using a signal to trigger it. So it's, it's about having constant light. So I can, take, I can take a small camera like this and I can set my value on my talent where I want it. The beautiful part about lighting the talent in front is the fact that the iris isn't shutting down and everything goes black. You, you know, you've got people sitting behind this gentleman. I used a flash. We may not even see them, but definitely wouldn't see you. Um, and so this gives you the opportunity to actually use a constant light that's not as evasive. It's fairly small if you put it on a DSL camera. Um, and, and this unit as well, because it's got a wider, obviously, surface area, so we're putting more light put in it. But if you're, if you're looking for an opportunity to do some stills, you can set that level, and you know that that's your level within the, excuse me, within the group, whether it's 400 ASA at 125, going around and getting shots and not having everything else go black. It's, it's daylight, but they didn't bring them up. I, I, I had, uh, we had a huge order at the factory. I couldn't get any units to bring out. Uh, I was going to give one to each of you today. I'm really, 
I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I will do the drawing, but they'll have to come later. But the ability of uh, snapping the cover off, putting your gel filters in, so if you want to change, you can. Or on the by, uh, on the by, uh, um, excuse me, on the Micro Pro, uh, the gels just slip right in here. So these are from their shootout area down below. They were kind enough to bring them up so we could at least show them. And you can store the gels in the back. So that that's a great option. This has become very very popular. When this when this was first introduced. Everybody went crazy for it, like they did the brick. It's like, wow, I battery operated light power, you know, I can control it. I've got the diffusion, but you make it brighter. It's always been the question: Can you make it brighter? Um, so we did. We went to the Micro Pro, um, doubled the amount of light output out of it, interchangeable filters and all. But it's having the controllability of it, being able to just fix just the right amount of light. And, and not have it wash everything out. You can put a soft filter in so it covers a wider area. And this has become um, hugely popular with the DSLR crews out there, people shooting with it. Um, 444, and I think there's a 50, uh, $50 discount going on. Sorry? 75 Is that what my company's doing this? It's unbelievable. No, we have a sales staff. Yeah, I think there's a different rebate value on this, and we actually pay the rebate. Our company pays it to the customer, not the, uh, not the dealer. Uh, that is two, $264. $264. I, I really ask you, if you haven't already, go look at the competitive product because they're a lot cheaper than ours. But there's a quality effect that if you start looking at the lights side by side in the color, if you have no problem shooting with blue or light and doing Photoshop and buying another one in a couple months because it overheated, you know, I'm really, I, I'm not here to sell. I'm here to really share information, uh, answer questions about why and how and when and all that. You're, you're all smart people. You'll make your own decision based on your information as well as your needs got a bale on the back of them. Every unit has a bale. This is this is a bale. So the bale could go into a nail on plate. It can go, you could take it off and put a metal slide and slide them in, uh, put diffusion outside the box. I mean there's there's quarter 20 threads which is basically all the way around the light on all four sides as well as two on the top and if you're not using the battery two on the back it for a, a way to fasten something to it. We did that intentionally because a lot of people will put this in places it wasn't even designed for. We have a car shoot they did in Vancouver where, um, if you've seen this robotic arm, it's called the Russian arm. It sits on top of the BMW and drives along. And so they basically built a box on the front of the car and they put 12 of these on it and made a soft box. And so when, um, no, I'm sorry, it was on the back of the car. And on the front, they put a little inverter and they ran all the lights off of that. And so they could go and adjust the light output, change the color, whatever, and had this beautiful soft box light that they drove around with all night. Yes, sir? Are you talking about the one by ones? Okay, uh, it goes in a stand. Yeah, that's what the bale is designed for. The bale is designed the 5 8 inch baby pin. You could take the handle out and you could actually put it in a junior receiver as well. Um, but I think the, the, the benefit is, is that we've kind of tried to figure into the, the housing a lot of different uses and a lot of different configurations, more so than it might be thought of originally. A lot of people will use them in their studios take them out, put them in a bag, and use them remotely, uh, gathering information, news, things like that. Yes, sir? This? Yeah. Correct. Correct. Now, obviously, the further away the diffusion is, the softer the light is. But one of the things that's kind of interesting about our light, do you guys mind if I turn this on where it's at? Not to blind you, but um, is in the fact that 
even though it's very close to source, because we have so many multiple LEDs, we've, we've created a large source with a lot of lights with a very small spectra point. So if this was four or five, it's going to be harsher on your eyes. But the fact there's this multiple layout, it's actually softer on your eyes. I mean, you seem mesmerized by it, but is it hard on your eyes? Yeah. And so if I took it out of your line of view to the person you were talking to, it's not as bad as it. Yeah. So that's the whole idea with the fact that there is, there is a, um, people have made up their own chimeras to put on top of this to get the diffusion further away and to have a bit of a softer wrap to it. But again, that depends. We have a couple different diffusions. A, a clear one, which is kind of like an opal, what they call opal diffusion. And then this is what we call a 250, which is a little bit thicker. But there's sailcloth material, which is called a light grid cloth. You can you can put anything you want in front of it. But people take it and use bubble wrap on it. Yes. Yeah, I've done yeah, I've done tests with this unit, whether it's a mono or a bicolor bifocus, uh, with a six fifty with a chimera. And the quality of light, they actually threw away their six fifties and chimeras and bought these. Simply because there's less heat generated, more comfortable light, and in the place that this was taking place, a lot of dignitaries coming in and it was a very small, tight room and it just it just seemed more open with less things. Kind of like David was alluding to originally, when I first walked in, there was two giant soft boxes. So people were sitting there, it was, they were like this, watching the show. Uh, also a lot of heat coming off of it. So that's what we tried to do. We tried to get rid of those and come up with another way of putting light in with a, a little bit less offensiveness. Right. Right. This is where I was hoping questions would take us into some things that I didn't put into the, the, the plan, but this is called our low profile. And what we do is we bend our LEDs instead of, instead of coming out straight, we bend them at a 40 degree angle. And what that does is, you know, light's light. You tell it where to go and it's going to go there. So if I'm, if, I, if I'm emitting a projected source, which is the great part of, of our lights over, let's say, fluorescence because of inverse law, you know, uh, you, that light can only go so far and then it's, it's done, it stops, it falls off. We're taking soft light because of all these multiple sources and projecting it. Still has a soft feel to it. Uh, so by taking the LEDs and breaking them at a 40 degree angle, you can actually get right up to the ceiling if you wanted. And these boxes are a little design it so that knowing where some of the markets are going, they're webcasters, they're, um, you know, People like Cisco using IntelliPresence, they have no overstructure that they can support standard lights from, or just it's too small an area. Suddenly, everybody's banging their head. So being able to go in and pull out a ceiling panel and drop your rigging in as part of the housing works really well. The more, the more you knock it down, the less projected value you get. So if I offered you a trick that you as a photographer may already know, but from 30 years of lighting people, um, in the film industry and other markets. My point is, close your eyes and look at the source. When you close your eyes and you look at the source, it allows your pupil to start to react to that light level change. When you open your eyes, your eyes are more acclimated to that light. So if you're shooting outside with HMIs or high output strobes or something and people are just, it's making them crazy, it's simply because their, their, their pupils are doing this. I'm look at the sun with their eyes closed. It works. The angle of lighting is pertinent to the shot you're trying to create. If you're trying to do a flat, full-on, overexposed look to that person's face, you're coming in from both sides of the camera, let's say. No matter where that softbox is, whether it's six inches off the ground or not, they have to get used to it. There's a reason that people are professionals that stand in front of cameras. Uh, they, can, they, can, they can deal with light. Uh, if they didn't, they learn how to. Um, I know that sounds a little bit crass, but it's, it's a reality. There's, there's no information I give you about people's reaction to a light being pointed in their face because everybody's different. But there's, there's techniques. You know, I've, I've walked up to uh, you know, different talent and had, the, had that light 
in its development stages and, and looked at them and said, you know, just a gesture, I'm going to bring this up. Okay, so they're ready for it. You know, when there's, when there's chaos going on, everybody's going to react to anything, whether it's the speakers going loud or feedback or, or, or light coming on, or somebody actually no light putting a camera in their face. You know, so I mean, I think it's just kind of you have to play with the idea of I'm gonna throw some light on you, and they go, oh great, and they're ready for it. I'd like to touch base on that comment a little bit because it, if it goes back to lighting 101, uh, the most beautiful light is obviously the sun or some dimension of it through diffusion, frames, what have you, because it's a living, breathing source. Uh, if you look back at the old photography, especially in motion pictures, where they were using arcs, which is a positive negative carbon with a conductor wrapped on the outside of it to give the current from the voltage to that point of contact when they struck together, it was a flame. And there's a, there's a huge quality difference between flame and electronic. Everyone got very consumed with HMIs when the French introduced them uh, simply because it cut down on the amount of people you needed. You had to have somebody sitting on that light all day looking through that quarter size uh, protective glass to look and make sure the distance was always right. Two to one ratio turning, making sure that flame didn't start spitting because you were starting to get too far a gap and it was, you know, jumping. And and HMIs, you can set it up on a stand, you could have one guy watch 10 of them. Start, 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 start. There it is, it's running. But it's got this electric feel to it. We think that in the proper LED usage and the fact you're going back to DC, you're taking away something in that pulse that people have come to know from HMIs. It's 50 or 60 hertz. It, it has something to do with how it's reacting to that current. You may not check it out or see it, but somebody epileptic might see it, right? So converting to DC is kind of going back to the arc where you have a constant current, a direct constant current, so there's no change. And that may be one of the things that some people that are familiar with light see. That it, has a, it, it, it has a spectrum that's a very difficult spectrum to get. We talked about that in the beginning and the X and Ys and how the LEDs are made and the spectrum of light, the color quality, um, color rendering index, all that thing. And actually, the color rendering index that everybody uses for measurement now is wrong for measuring LEDs because it's a whole different technology. And you'll see more and more of that coming out. But going to daylight, monitors, white balancing, they're in the 6,000 to 62, where several years ago they were in 54, 5600. So there's, this, there's a change happening. The spectrum is the most important part, how that quality of light looks. There's a reason that all these people I've talked about today have picked it, and it's simply because of the quality. He's seen something different in it when he's watching that show. They're using that compared to something else. There's other products out there that will have um, red thrown in because of a narrow band spike that's missing in the CRIs. So they put red in to get the color index up to 95. But that's, that's baloney because that's not how it's read. That's not how the camera sees it. That's why you can look at a monitor and look through the camera and that's pretty much what you're gonna get. And by trying to mix RGB into white light, RGB can make a million light colors, but it can't make one effectively because you're taking three and asking them to work at different levels mixed together to create that. And suddenly you're overdriving them as well to get the output out through those lenses. Now you have what happens is called sine wave effect, whereas the heat dissipating off of that die through the circuit board is starting to affect the, the voltage fluctuation. And that's what we're talking about when you're seeing something that's running at pulse width modulation on AC something that's not running pulse mod modulation on DC, converted to DC. There's very subtle things that your eye may not see, but the electronics will. And the color starts to go, and then you're just, if you're working a board or whatever, you're trying to mix, you're constantly having to check that color. It's not holding. It's not staying constant. It's constantly having to be adjusted. 
if it's a primary color like a green or a purple or a cyan on a back wall, it can, it can hold that color easily. But when you're going to tungsten or daylight, it's very difficult. And the more research you'll do, you'll find that that's, that's kind of like their, that's the, the one thing that's holding them back. I'm not being the engineer, but basically all we're doing is we're controlling how constant the current and voltage is to that, that die I showed earlier. Whereas in, for instance, uh, pulse width modulation, it's chopped a different way. And so you have valleys in that cycle which are affecting the output of the light. In, in simple terms, I think it's just a matter that we're able to control that, that voltage and current constantly through the whole process of dimming. We're not having it chopped as we're going through it. We're sliding just right across an even plane. And, and the LED with capacitors and transistors and then the voltage input can be getting the right amount of voltage even if the voltage is dropping. Most voltages are gonna work from nine to 12 or nine to, nine to 12, let's say. You drop be below that, there's not enough power for, um, let's say the battery to hold up after nine. But there's still cell life left and what we're doing is in that dimming process, we're, we're telling it it's still getting nine volts even though we're giving it less. I think it, it, it's something that you have to try. And trust me, there's plenty of places around that rent the lights. I, I highly suggest people rent something before they buy it. So you can find out whether it's worth it or not and whether it's worth what you do with it or not. Um, the, the effect of a softbox is based on holding all the light into a given area by a diffuser and possibly an inner baffle. So you start with more than you need because you know you're gonna start putting diffusion to it to soften it out. And you're putting certain diffusions on because you know the characteristics of that, uh, whether it's shower curtain or whether it's muslin or whether it's uh, 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 grid cloth or uh, a 250 or a highlight. All these materials have different kind of values of transmission. The light grid will have a tendency to let the light wrap around as you're saying more and also the direction of it and how broad is that source, how much, how much is it going to bleed around. In, in the unit, by packing so many units into that given field, we're creating basically a layer of diffusion instead of one spectral hotspot that we're knocking down or putting stuff in. We're giving you high output with a diffused look to begin with. And you can see that by, you know, the fact that that this soft light I'm coming into and then I'm going out of. I mean, it, it's based on those doors shutting it off from here to here, here to here. If I put soft diffusion on the outside of it, it's gonna become like a Shamira bubble. It's gonna, it's gonna end up doing what you've asked it to do. So having a multiple source as a soft projected key first takes away the fact that you need more than you would if um, you were using a traditional light. You have to have a bigger source, whether it's 1200, 575, or 200. You, you, you pick that unit based on how far away you plan on being from the town. And then what the characteristic is. If I move that diffusion in close to the face, I'm gonna have a softer chance of it wrapping because I'm closer and the intensity that I need. But I can do the same thing with this in, in the fact that it has it has no heat projected from it. So having that softness on it from here to this, you can start to see I'm getting a wrap over onto this cheek around here. My face is making the, you know, the conforming of it just because of the way it is. It's long and, long and narrow, sorry. Um, so I think I'm trying to answer the question. I hope I'm doing a right, a, a right answer to you, but it, there's so many variables involved um, in what you're going to use that soft box for. And that's also why, you know, you'll say, I can get away with a 575, but I'm going to get 1,200. I'd rather have more than not enough because I can always knock it down. And it all goes back to the material you choose. So I think it, it has the same kind of a quality to start off with as a soft box simply because it's a very large soft projected value not a pinpoint. I think the idea is with everybody here, you know, everybody's got 
a creative force to them. Uh, if I go to the hardware store and I get a bolt, the bolt was designed for one thing, but I may use it for three or four different ideas that are completely separate from what it was designed for. And we found that in our marketplace uh, by people writing to us or seeing them on TV or in a picture or somebody talking about it, used in absolutely, you know, crazy different usages, some stuff we've never, never even thought of. We originally made a stacket bracket, which was just a simple slide bar that allowed you to put two of these on and a center quarter 20 thread so you could screw it to the bottom of your camera and have one on each side. Or um, There's a lot of stuff out there now from other manufacturers that are sliding brackets that allow you to put multiple on-camera accessories on. I think it's just, you know, kind of looking around and being inventive with what's available. We've tried to really work hard at making accessories, but the thing we have to keep in mind is um, it takes a lot of time and effort, and we don't mind if it's the right project that a lot of people will catch on and use. But to do onesies, twosies, it's, it's very difficult with the schedule we're trying to do with new product development. But if you do have an eye for uh, uh, something, you're more than welcome to send it and see if it's something that we can point you in the direction of, either we have or somebody else may have. Any, any voltage anywhere in the world with our power supplies because we never know where they're going. So when you buy a kit, it has all the multiple connectors so that you can change it from country to country. The unit will come with a power supply bracket, which is like the battery bracket, put it on, comes with power supply, uh, comes with, um, and, and there's also different configurations where you can buy kits, like a two light kit with folding stands. You buy the kit and then pick which lights you want to, to put in there. Um, there's, there's a lot of information on the website as far as the configurations and accessories and all that. Uh, it actually comes, it comes from us. It comes from us. You buy it, you buy it here, you get your rebate coupon, you mail it to us, we, we um, file it, and we send you a check. Wherever there's a rebate. So some units, yeah, uh, there's, there's some good rebates going on right now uh, to get the year started. So in a number of different products, there's some good rebates. You just have to check with whoever you're buying it from and ask them about it. Um, and there's also information on the website that shows rebates available. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not going to change anything in regards to the one-by-ones. Those are going to stay the same. When I'm talking about, uh, we will have a hybrid unit that will be available that will be $75 more than this product is now. That will be available at the end of April. That would be in this size here. Yes. And the other thing is, um, what we're going to be doing at NAB is introducing a whole new line of lights, which is kind of um, filling in the holy grail. Uh, most lighting directors will say, I love the lights for an ambience, but I want to go in and I want to spot something into this, and I want sharp edges. So what we'll be introducing at NAB will be filling that void that they've been asking for. And it's going along a whole different road of technology than everybody that's copying us or following our footsteps. And we're also always working on keeping the product affordable, but trying to give you insight into what that is and why that's built the way it is and how the components figure in and how the engineering for the design on the code works in. There's a reason that you're paying more. And it's the quality of the light and the lifespan of that light. So please keep that in mind when you're talking to your friends about what we talked about today.